Thank you very much. If you think you had a shock in November 2016, <laughs> imagine being in Britain, where on June the 23rd, 52% of the British electorate stunned the media and political establishment by voting for Brexit. Shortly before that moment, a survey of opinion pollsters, journalists and academics, about 300 uh, of those folks, had asked them how they thought the Brits were going to vote. And over 95% said the Brits would vote to stay in the European Union. That was around about the same time as forecasters in the US were saying that Hillary Clinton would win Texas and gave her a 95% probability of victory. And we have more data than ever before, yet we are consistently getting the public mood wrong. I'm going to talk today about Europe, and I'm going to start with a question. Are we nearer the end uh, of a period of political volatility, as represented by Brexit and Trump? Or are we actually nearer the beginning of a new period of volatility and change? Donald Trump, Brexit, Marine Le Pen in France, one 35% of the vote. Gert Wilders wants to tear down the European Union, finish second. Populist rebellions seem to be kicking off all over the place. If you look at Western democracies, particularly those in Europe, parties that in various forms want to either radically reform the European Union or tear it down altogether, have been enjoying some of their strongest results in history. Uh, Austria, Denmark, Hungary, Poland, Switzerland, the UK. These parties have done well in some of the most highly developed, most highly educated states on the planet with highly developed welfare regimes. If this was just about the financial crisis, how do you explain that populist right movements have won over 25% of the vote in countries like Austria and the Netherlands, which have some of the lowest unemployment rates in the West? They've done well in the highly developed northern European states. They've done very well in the much less developed, very homogenous central and east European states. They've now done well in states that we used to argue were completely immune to populism. When I was doing my PhD, there were four countries that academics used to say, you will never have populism there. Britain, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands. Sweden and the Netherlands were historically liberal. Britain was seen as being the birthplace of parliamentary democracy. In Germany, I don't need to explain uh, what happened uh, there. Each of those states now have highly successful uh, populist movements. How you answer that first question about are we nearer the end of a period of volatility or are we nearer the beginning ultimately depends on whether you're an optimist uh, or a pessimist and how you interpret the evidence. If you're an optimist, many of my economists uh, friends are optimists. They say, well, actually, if you look at the fundamentals, US employment figures are good. The Eurozone is recovering. 2017 was the best year for global growth since 2010. Emerging markets are doing well. And even in Britain, OK, you guys made a silly decision, but the British economy is proving to be more resilient than the IMF and other forecasters suggested. You might say, relax. You might also point to this idea of generational change. This is a popular, sexy argument that argues that effectively tolerant millennials are about to take over the world, and the angry old white man who propelled uh, Trump and Brexit forward is, how can I say this diplomatically, uh, is slipping over the horizon. It's a seductive argument. If you look at Brexit, among my students, 18 to 24-year-olds, only 27% voted to leave the European Union. 
If you look at those folks over 65, 60% voted to leave the European Union. There's an economist that has actually calculated that if you assume birth rates and death rates in the UK stay the same, then Remain will become a dominant, overwhelming majority by 2022. So if you want a second referendum, have it in 2022. <laughs> and optimists say, do you remember Pierre Pujard? A populist in 1950s France, one of the first big post-war populists. Did very well in 1956, rallied small shopkeepers, small businessmen against Paris and the corrupt elites. But he was gone as quickly as he arrived. It was a flash protest. And I think this, this guy's important because how we interpret populism today is essentially the same. You read it all the time. These are flash protests. Once we get economic growth back, once we get jobs going, once we deal with the debt, once we get past the crisis, all of this is going to go away. It's a Pujard thesis. If you're an optimist, you point to guys like that. But pessimists, you might say realists, not in an IR sense perhaps, but they say volatility is not just back, but it's here to stay. And they point to different sources of evidence. They say, if you look at every major populist rebellion in the West over the last 10 years, the key divide is not about income. And the key divide isn't about age. The key divide is education. The educational divide was much bigger, not only uh, in terms of explaining Trump, but also Brexit. Among those Brits with no qualifications whatsoever, 75% voted for Brexit. 75%. Among graduates, it was 24%. That gap, 50 points. That is remarkable. You guys saw it too. If you look at uh, areas that have, um, uh, as the numbers of uh, folks with a high school education or less goes up, the swing to Trump goes up. And this educational divide is going to be with us for a long, long time. In fact, enrollments into certain US universities are now declining. Enrollments into UK universities are declining for the first time in post-war history. If you're a pessimist, you might say, well, actually, what's different from the days of Pierre Pujard in the 50s is that populists today have built much stronger social bonds with key groups in the West. If you look at Western democracies like Austria, like France, like Switzerland, the populist right is now the number one working class revolt. Around 50 to 60% of its electorate comes from manual workers, low-skilled service sector workers, uh, routine workers, receptionists, uh, shop workers, folks that have been left behind by the economic transformation, but also folks who hold a very different outlook on key issues like migration, identity, and Euro the European Union. It was in 1995, 1995, that Jean-Marie Le Pen in France became the most popular politician among the working class. This isn't about a crisis. This has been a long time coming. It was in 2014 that Nigel Farage, close friends with Donald Trump, became the most popular politician among the British working class. And if you look at where new movements like the Alternative for Germany are breaking through, lots of areas that used to be controlled by the left. This isn't to say that it is only a working class revolt, but work is a key. If you look at the Brexit alliance, afterwards lots of folks said, oh, it's just poor white workers. They're absolutely central to Brexit. But there were three groups that caused Brexit. There were middle class affluent Eurosceptics, good incomes, nice houses, good jobs, older working class voters, typically retired, used to support the Labour Party, and really economically marginalized voters that were especially concerned about immigration. But what they shared was a very similar outlook. They didn't see the case for the European Union. They felt very anxious over migration and ethnic change. And they did not trust the political establishment. But it was an alliance, much in the same way that Trump's electorate was an alliance. Everybody got carried away when they read Hillbilly Elegy and they said, well, this is all about the white underclass. 
That's one group within the electorate, an important one, but only one. And if you were perhaps also painting a more pessimistic picture, you'd, you'd point to the demise of what I would call the anchors, the old anchors in Western democracy. We are seeing something completely remarkable right now in Europe. We're seeing this, the collapse of social democracy. Sometimes you don't notice fundamental political change when it's happening around you, but this is, this is fundamental. Since 2015, support for social democracy has fallen off a cliff. Last week, the German Social Democrats polled 15% of the vote, one five. This was the most successful political party in German uh, history. And if that was replicated at an election, that would be their worst result since the 1880s. Think about 2017. The French Socialists wiped off the map. The Dutch Labour Party wiped off the map. Both of them reduced to 6%. The Austrian Social Democrats reached their lowest number of seats in their history. The German Social Democrats were reduced to their worst performance since 1933. The Brits are excited about Jeremy Corbyn. He's our version of Bernie Sanders, but he's still out of power. If you go back to 2000, 10 of the 15 governments in Europe had left-wing parties in them. Today, only five of 27 do. Social democracy faces a fundamental question, which is not only how can it revive, but can it survive? It's being squeezed by the populist right, who are taking workers, and it's being squeezed by the populist left, who are winning over middle-class liberals. It's a pressing and fundamental shift in Europe. And if you're a pessimist, you might also point to some counterintuitive findings. That idea about the angry old white man, it's comfortable, and it's a seductive idea, but it's completely misleading. If you looked at the folks who turned out for Marine Le Pen in France, she wanted to basically pull France out of the Euro and probably wants to, to completely uh, leave the European Union. Um, she was strongest among the under 40s. If you look at Austria, the Freedom Party wants to do the same. It's number one group, young Austrian men without degrees. If you look at Brexit, the average age of the leavers was 52. That's not that old. Right? We are seeing shifts that are happening that are going to give populist rebellions far more gasoline. Right? There's more gasoline left in this tank than many people would have us believe. There's a new generation of Europeans that feel left behind in their own way. The legacy of the crisis is part of it, but it's not only about that. Folks that aren't getting into higher education, that feel anxious over the refugee crisis, and that don't feel like the mainstream is giving them any competent responses. And if you are a pessimist, you'll point to new patterns at elections. We're seeing some new things in Europe. When you go back to those German elections that stunned observers, the alternative for Germany, some see it as a far-right party, others see it as a protest party, wants to pull Germany out of the Euro, very critical of how Angela Merkel's handled the refugee crisis. The number one source of votes for the AFD? Non-voters. People that came back into the political system who'd given up on politics long ago. The reason most pollsters didn't see Brexit coming was because about two and a half million working class white voters turned out to vote that had been ignoring the opinion polls and hadn't voted at the previous election. The rise of populism is having an important effect politically. It's giving a message to groups that haven't voted at recent elections that they now have a voice in the conversation. And this is going to disrupt party loyalties in a way that we're only beginning to anticipate. If you have another election in Germany, these voters will turn out again, because now there's somebody representing their values. And pessimists might say, what about this new debate about post-populism? And this is what I think is the most interesting aspect of where we are. We're having a debate about what is post-liberalism. But we are going to enter into a new debate, which is what is post-populism? What happens if Trump doesn't deliver, uh, doesn't deliver? What happens if Brexit doesn't bring back the jobs in the northern industrial 
labour heartlands. What happens if the new right-wing government in Austria doesn't manage to stop refugees crossing the border? What happens if voters realise that populists don't deliver? The dominant thinking, or the assumption, is that those voters simply drift back to the mainstream. I don't understand why that uh, view is so entrenched. If you look at the Brexit debate right now, just think about all that Britain has seen since that momentous decision. Sterling crashed through the floor, endless financial institutions said the British economy is over, London is going to crash, financial services are going to flee, Britain is a second-rate nation, blah, blah, blah. In hindsight, do you think the vote for Brexit was right or wrong? The blue line, the percentage of voters saying right. The green line, the percentage saying wrong. It hasn't shifted at all. Yesterday, YouGov asked this question again. It would just have split down the middle. Nobody's going to change their minds. They're too invested in it. These views, these opinions will remain static. Trump's approval ratings are low. They're not that low if you look at his core, core demographic. If you look at whites without degrees, rural voters, Trump's approval ratings actually aren't that bad. In the same way, leavers are not changing their minds and they're unlikely to. So if you're going to push for a second referendum, it's an incredibly risky strategy. That hides some big variations, I'm not denying that. 18 to 24 year olds, 73% in Britain say Brexit was the wrong decision. My students are furious. They feel that baby boomers have completely shut them out of the conversation. Okay, if you look at London, 50% of London feels it was the wrong decision. Only 38% of Londoners feel it was the right decision. But if you go through other groups, pensioners, workers, the North, conservatives, they say this was the right decision. And something that you don't hear so much in the coverage on Brexit, we were surveying thousands of voters from 20, 2008 onwards. They said before the Brexit vote even happened that they expected it would hurt the economy. They expected the economy would decline, but they felt that that was an okay trade-off if over the longer term they got control over borders and security. About half of the, leave the leavers said they would even be happy if one of their relatives lost a job because of Brexit, if it meant that they got Brexit. It was never an economic vote. So what is clear is, if you look across Europe, my take on this, at least, is that the fundamentals are changing. There isn't going to be a short-term switch back to the mainstream. We are now increasingly going to have to be operating in an environment that includes fractured parliaments, unstable coalitions, divided governments, and record levels of volatility. A recent paper in the European Journal of Political Research by two academics, Hans-Peter Creasy and Enrique Hernandez, found that levels of volatility in Europe meaning people switching between different parties from one election to the next, no tribal uh, loyalties, levels of volatility are now at their highest level since mass democracy began. And that includes the turbulent interwar period, the 1930s. More people are switching. So we had a lot of this, which is a lot of enthusiasm about Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel. But, I, you know, my, my view is it completely ignores the reality of Europe today, which is fragmentation, volatility, and division. Look at a few recent outcomes. Slovakia, eight wildly different parties in parliament, a shaky, diverse coalition. Spain, very prolonged government formation. One, one in three voters went to the populist left or to a populist citizens movement. Portugal. For the first time since it transitioned to democracy, now led by new and largely inexperienced leftist groups. Belgium couldn't figure out a coalition for 138 days. Netherlands couldn't figure out how to form a government for 208 days. That was a record. Austria, completely polarized. 2016, no mainstream party candidate made it into the final round. It was a green versus a radical right populist. Germany, worst result for the centre-left for decades. And in the east of Germany, the populist right emerged as the most popular choice among men. The number one party in eastern Germany was the alternative for Deutschland. 
And in the UK, there's been a lot of talk about the return of two-party politics. We had an election last year that saw both of the mainstream parties do very well. That was disguising a very important fact. At the two elections either side of that Brexit referendum, 2015 and 2017, more voters switched their uh, choice than at any point in British political history. We had Conservatives going Liberal Democrat, we had Labour going Conservative, we had UK Independence Party going Conservative. Complete volatility, which means that the UK party system, were it not for first past the post, would be just as fragmented, just as volatile as many of the European party systems that we see, many of which are moving very quickly to the right as it deals with issues like migration. The key question, of course, underlying this is why? And I'm just going to put out one quick thesis in my final four minutes. And I think you can guess where I am on that first question of, are we nearer the end or are we nearer the beginning of a period of volatility? I'm a big believer in value change. I think that what we're now beginning to see is a politicization of a value-based backlash to events that began about 40, 50 years ago and which have a long way to run. This is why I just don't buy arguments that say this is about what happened after the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the recession. Those events certainly enlarged space for populists and they exacerbated some of the divides. But this stuff has been a long time coming. You'll probably know the work of Ron Inglehart, Pippa Norris as well, um, both at Harvard. Um, Ron Inglehart, nice book uh, in the 70s, showed pretty convincingly that as you go from one generation to the next, people were becoming increasingly likely to take on post-materialist values. Individualism, uh, freedom of expression, minority rights, a more liberal outlook on immigration, European integration, comfortable with shifting power up to the transnational level. Why? Because they were buffeted by economic growth and because they were participating in much higher levels of higher, um, uh, access to university. The problem is that the theory of value change, which effectively argued that over the long haul, Western democracies will become more liberal, is that it overestimated the pace of that change and underestimated the backlash among groups that weren't uh, feeling as though they were benefiting from economic growth uh, and higher education. We forget this now, but in the 1980s, these two guys were dominating Europe's political debate. Uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen on the left, Jörg Haider on the right. Uh, Jörg Haider's populist slogan uh, at the time was, um, they hate me because I'm with you. Classic populist slogan. But these two guys started to win support in the 80s, which led a political scientist called Piero Ignazzi. We forget about Ignazzi now, but he was well ahead of his time. He said, hang on a second, if this post-material value shift is supposed to be happening, why are these guys doing so well? And Ignazzi, who was writing in the early 90s, argued that what we were seeing was not what Inglehart called a silent revolution, a silent revolution of rising post-materialists, but what Ignazzi called a silent counter-revolution among voters who held traditionalist values, and they were effectively joining into an alliance between authoritarians and conservatives to push back against that value change. So when we talk about globalists and nationalists today, we're talking about a shift that began decades ago and which has become more apparent to voters because key issues like the refugee crisis, like terrorism, like immigration, and like ethnic change are suddenly making these two broad blocks realize that there are other voters in society that have a fundamentally different outlook from you. And it will carry on with Me Too and Time's Up and so on. And the value conflict will exacerbate and it will become more pronounced. The only difference is now traditionalists feel as though there is a voice for them in the political system that they might not have had in earlier years. So if you look at Brexit, this is some work we did. This was in the book that uh, Indira mentioned. From 1993 onwards, if you ask voters, do you want to stay in the European Union or do you want to leave the European Union, the value divides were completely visible at that point. Folks with no qualifications, 
blue collar workers consistently more likely to say, let's get out. And why David Cameron called the referendum, I don't know. But if he looked at this part of the chart, where you see an explosion of Euroscepticism in Britain, his strategist should have been saying, actually, the writing's on the wall. Uh, there is a divide going on here that looks like it's going to cause some major problems for you. And that divide can be seen in the attitudes of leavers and remainers to that, to that question of whether Britain should stay or leave. Folks that said, actually, I support rights for women, gender equality, I support rights for same-sex couples, I don't really want stiffer sentences for criminals, I certainly don't support capital punishment and the death penalty, they were much less likely to support leave. The leave vote came from voters who, from a values perspective, were much more wary about all of those things, about the expansion of social liberalism. And that's why when Cameron doubled down on economic self-interest, he was never going to convince these voters. They were far more likely to say, bring back the death penalty, give criminals stiffer sentences. I'm not so sure about rights for same-sex couples. I'm not so sure about rights for women. And that value division played out there quite nicely. And just to underline that, we asked about 30,000 Leave voters, why did you vote for Brexit in your own words? And then put the answer in a word cloud. That word cloud looks like that. <laughs> and then we asked 30,000 Remainers, why did you vote to remain in the European Union? And that word cloud looks a bit like that. Two fundamentally different views, not meeting in the middle, no real consensus. And I think that is the real challenge for the mainstream, especially in Europe now, is going to be how do you bring those groups together. And we asked them, where do you think your country should head next over the next four years? And Leavers said, leave the European Union, reduce immigration, reduce overseas aid, strengthen the armed forces. Remainers said, build more affordable homes, raise tax on high earners, increase the minimum wage, abolish tuition fees. The only point of convergence in these groups is increased spending on the National Health Service. That's it. There's no other convergence. That's it. How you're going to bring those groups back together, I do not know. But this is my final point, which is in Europe especially, and I know it, the parallels here will be speaking to you loud and clear, we are now in an era in which identity politics is going to exacerbate all of these divides big time. Eurobarometer asked voters across Europe, what are the top issues for you today? The top two right now, terrorism and immigration. Identity politics is dominant. It's not going to go anywhere. How governments respond to those perceived threats is going to be incredibly important because the underlying divide is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. That was fascinating. I want a copy of your PowerPoint. That was great. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I'm going to take a wild guess here that uh, on the question of are we at the beginning or the end of, of this populism, uh, the rise of the populist right, I think you probably think we're at the beginning. And on the optimist pessimist chart, I'm taking it that you're a pessimist. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So take us forward with this. Is all hope lost? Or is there some way that, I don't know if we should call it the mainstream, but the sort of um, liberal international order that we all had been a part of, is there a way for that to regain the footing? I think for Europe, it's going to be very, very difficult. There are two big problems. One is, I've talked about a value divide among voters. There's a, another value divide between nations. If you talk to Hungarians and Poles about the refugee crisis, for example, they have a fundamentally different outlook about how that should be handled from, say, the French and the Germans. Those, those value conflicts are not going to go anywhere anytime soon. But even within party systems, for me, the collapse of social democracy runs through all of that. Because I, I was saying, um, I was saying uh, to Jerry earlier on, I think the, the pace at which Europe is moving to the right um, we're still underestimating that. 
Uh, and I think that will have profound consequences in how we think of things like European integration, how we think of things like law and order, security, borders, our relations with Africa, uh, our relations with Russia, um, and our relations with the US, obviously. We've got, you know, what, a lot of commentators got very excited about Macron. Mm -hmm. Macron, to me, is Macron's on the losing side. The winners are the guys we don't like to talk about. Viktor Orban in Hungary, Sebastian Kurz in Austria, Theresa May. We laugh at Theresa May during the Brexit negotiations, but she's only lost one or two votes in, in Parliament. We're underestimating, I still think, the strength uh, of conservatism, and we're underestimating uh, the scale of these value conflicts, which aren't going to go anywhere anytime soon. So do you think Brexit is just the beginning of this leading edge? Are we going to be looking at Pexit or, I don't know, people were talking about Frexit before, um, before Macron won. But, I mean, are there other countries who are also going to say this European idea, the project, it's not really for us? I mean, I look at Poland and I worry about them. E the EU has been terrific for Poland, but the current government doesn't seem so excited excited about having to be part of a European project. Look, I mean, we're going to have a real world test case in the next couple of weeks with Italy. Um, and you know, what's interesting is, take France. France will never, I'd, personally, I don't think the French would ever vote to leave the European Union. But about half of them voted for Eurosceptic candidates in round one of the French presidential election. And at the Italy election in two, two weeks or so, I suspect we'll see Five Star win the popular vote but be kept out of government. And a lot of commentators will say, oh well, Europe's beaten the latest populist crusade, Five Star isn't in government, la la la. Five Star was only founded in 2013. It's led by a comedian. We're now in a state where a populist party <laughs> led by a comedian is winning the, populist, uh, winning the popular vote, winning the polls. It's been ahead in the last 70 opinion polls. And we're kind of saying, no, no, that's OK. That's just Italy. The Italians are kind of crazy anyway. So let's just, you know. But this, to me, is actually, it's a nice test case of how we are continually underestimating the pace of change within Europe and how volatile the situation is. Let's say Beppe Grillo and Five Star aren't invited into government. And they have a sit down. They say, well, how do we get up to that 40% of the vote? And they say, let's offer a referendum on the euro. Or let's offer a referendum on EU membership. All it takes is a country like Italy to have a referendum, somebody else leaves, and the thing is not going to be around for too much longer. And I think that, that is the issue. For the first time, my last point is, for the first time in the history of the European Union, after Brexit is done and the negotiations are finished, there will be a model for how countries leave the European Union. All right, briefly, in the short time we have left, I know that you were sort of shooting down this idea that the younger, the next generation, is that it's going to be inevitable, the generational change. But those are striking, the figures of how the young people in Britain have a completely different view, how they're remainers, they have different social values, supporting same-sex marriage, supporting women's rights, supporting human rights and immigration and all of those things. Are you not seeing across Europe enough of a generational shift that, you know, you're saying 52 is not that old, but, you know, those people are going to die eventually, right? Well, <laughs> are, we not, are we not seeing something where, where the younger people are actually going to make a difference? Well, I'd, I'd say just a couple of quick things. One is that, so there are different effects that we talk about in political science. One is a life cycle effect. And I've got a colleague at Oxford, James Tilley, who has shown that as you get one year older every year, you become 0.38% more conservative. Wow. Okay? And that, by the, now people say. Happy birthday, everyone. People say, <laughs> yeah, say 0.38, well, that's not a lot. Well, over the course of a lifetime, that's, you know, that, that's a, that would explain the 20 point gap that we see in the UK with the older folks going conservative and the younger going Labour. And the second thing I would say is I remember a Democrat pollster coming to London before your election who will remain nameless, but his book is called America Ascendant. Yeah. <laughs> and he gave us a long speech about how Trump could never win the election and Democrats were going to dominate for 20 years because the newly ascendant groups in America, including millennial students, were going to dominate, right? Now look at your election. Key groups of that newly ascendant coalition failed to mobilize. Millennial students, African Americans, young minorities, a greater number went to Trump than pollsters anticipated. And we saw the same thing at Brexit. The two hipster districts of London, right, Camden and Hackney, where all the cool kids hang out, 
recorded lower than average levels of turnout at the Brexit referendum than other areas. Yet after the referendum, the number of signatures for a second vote was largest in Camden and Hackney. So my message to students and others is, if you want real change, if you want political change, you have to participate in the political system. And that is why differential turnout is going to decide where the West goes over the next 10, 20 years. Which side can get their, their base to turn out to a greater extent? And that's why I haven't ridden off the prospect that Trump will win again in 2020. Because I, I don't see the convincing message from the Democrats that is going to inspire the group. Anti-Trump does not inspire like pro-Democrat would inspire. That's fascinating.